access the I don't know how to access the ones for the lecture, but for the labs, I've been looking at those. I feel like um, those are helpful. But the ones for the lecture, I don't know how to access those. Okay, if you have any questions, you can ask me. Sorry for being late. I had to uh, get my phone to uh, log into Zoom again. I think this is the second time uh, this term where I've had to do that. And uh, I'm not quite sure why, because I've requested that it run for two weeks. And I'm pretty sure this has been within two weeks. I'm also having trouble with Zoom making the lab classes. So you may have noticed the first time I, I sent you uh, a class from last term. And I think I did uh, last Tuesday, meaning uh, this Tuesday. Uh, the lab did not make again. And so I had to give you the class from last term. I'm not sure what the problem is, but I have Zoom set up so it'll automatically download. And apparently the last automatic update uh, has a bug in it. And at least in the lab classes, uh, I'm not able to make the video for the lab sessions. And I'm not sure what to do about it. I'll, I'll have to go in to talk to uh, Clark and uh, I can maybe try to talk to Zoom, but they have already sent me some information and it wasn't very helpful. Uh, I'm not sure why it's only working on the lab, but the last two labs, I have not been able to make the movie. Any question about any of that? All right, any questions about anything else? Yeah, actually, we were just discussing um, if we had access to your lecture notes, like the PowerPoints that you use in the lecture. Are we able to see that anywhere? Um, you do have access to them after we finish the lesson. Before the lesson, you have access to the notes and the, what do I call them? Let me go to study guide. Study guide. You have access to the study guide and to the notes. Okay. Where do we find the PowerPoints after the lecture? Let me go there. I'm going to take a look. So chapter one and chapter 10 are done. Um, we are, we did finish chapter two, didn't we? So I can make those available yeah. to you now too. If you don't see them after we're done with the class, remind me to uh, make them available to you. But uh, let me share my screen. I'll show you where they are. So for chapter two, chapter two, week two lecture, there's the study guide and the notes, I think. It has the same information we're talking about in the class, but it is in a text format as opposed to uh, a slideshow. And what's very good about the study guide and the objective is I have the objectives there for the lesson and all of the quiz questions will come from the objectives. So if you know the objectives and you can answer them, then you should be able to take the quiz questions. And that's true for the final as well as the, the quiz for the, you know, the, the chapter. Anyways, after the objectives, there will be the uh, chapter notes. And like I said, this will be the lesson in a, uh, it's actually an outline text format. But after we're done with the lesson, let me go back. 
What did I do here? Oh, I see. I opened a new window. After we're done with the lesson, uh, you guys can ask if I haven't done it. I will make the PowerPoint available for you. And it's a PDF file, but it's the same as the PowerPoint. I just activated chapter two now, but chapter one and 10 are up. And there's the study guide for chapter one and then the uh, the PowerPoint for chapter one and chapter 10. Any questions? I don't make the PowerPoint available to you before the lesson because it's well known, and there's been many studies on this, that students learn best if they take their own notes and then study from their own notes. So I'm encouraging you to take your own notes and then study from your own notes. In fact, if you take notes, you will learn the material two times better than if you just listen to the lesson, or you just read the textbook, you'll learn the material two times better. Now, that said, uh, how many times do you, does a student, I may have talked about this when I was talking about the syllabus, how many times does a student have to go over something before they actually learn it? Anyone remember, or does anybody know? I guess like seven, I don't remember though. It's actually uh, closer to 20. You have to go over something 20 times before you actually learn it. Now, if you really want to learn it and you're putting in the effort to learn it, you can learn it uh, faster than going over 20 times. I don't know what that number is, but it is faster than 20 times. And uh, all of these studies have always been done on middle school students, and I don't know why the people doing the research always do the studies on middle school students. But if you think about it, when somebody's playing a piano piece, they can't just learn it by playing it one time. They have to repeat it time and time again. And if you look at the Olympic athletes, they will be practicing all the time. And that's because they have to learn how to do whatever they're doing, and uh, that takes practice. So that's true in all things in life. Anyways, if you uh, take your own notes, you actually are going over the material twice because you're listening to it. And then in your brain, you're translating it into another part of your brain to write it down. So you will learn the material two times better if you're taking notes than if you're just listening. If you listen or read, you actually only learn 10% of the material. If you take notes, you learn 20% of the material, which is still really low. And that tells you to learn the material well, you have to go over it time and time again. So hopefully you'll be going over your notes throughout the term, as well as before a quiz or an exam. Any question about any of that? And that's why I'm not making the PowerPoint available to you to begin with. I want you to write your own notes. You will learn the material better. But I do give it, make it available to you after we're done so that you can add to your notes. Any question about any of that? I hope you understand that I'm making more work and trouble for myself hoping that you guys will learn the material better. It would be easier for me just to make everything available at the start, and then I don't have to do anything uh, throughout the rest of the term. Uh, you can use my notes to take your notes if you want. Print them out and then add to them. All right, um, any questions about anything else? Um, somebody should look to see, maybe somebody's looked, 
uh, has anyone looked to see if the lab is up for last Tuesday? I'm not sure I ever put it up. So let me just look at that now. Well, that'll be one way to do it. Yeah, that's uh, from last term, so it should be up. All right, any questions about anything? I do not know why Zoom is having trouble. I have worked with Zoom for years and I've never had any trouble with the video or the file making a video, but uh, this time I am. Unfortunately, it's only the lab. All right, if there's no questions, let's uh, go to the syllabus. Today is... Uh, July 27th, and we should be on chapter four. I don't remember if we started chapter four or not. Yes, we did start chapter four. And... Uh, we covered the topic of glycocalyx, how it can be a capsule, a slime layer, or an extracellular polysaccharide um, layer, which you find in biofilms. Uh, let me go back to the syllabus. There will be a lab today. It'll be lab five. And I should tell you, you should read the unknown project instructions. I'm going to talk about the unknown project on uh, Tuesday. So for the lab, we're not going to have a real lab. I'm going to be talking about the unknown project. This will be a project you'll be doing starting from about Tuesday to almost the end of the term. Where you can find the unknown project file Go to the lab. It's lab five, I think. Yeah, lab five. The unknown instructions. Uh, so take a look at this and we'll talk about it next Tuesday. Any question about anything? All right, let's go back. Well, up here. All right, if there's no questions, let's uh, talk about flagella. Let me get that out of the way. We're now moving on to some structures external to the cell wall. The flagella is mostly external to the cell wall. But there is a part of the flagella which is anchored into the cell wall, and it's actually anchored also into the, a, the plasma membrane. But most of the flagella is outside the cell. It is a whip-like structure that beats sort of like a whip. Uh, and uh, prokaryotes have this structure for locomotion. If they can move or swim, it's because the prokaryotic cell has at least one flagellum. Prokaryotes can only move by having flagella. Uh, flagella are made of the uh, protein flagellin. You don't need to know the different parts of the flagellum. Any question about any of that? 
there are four basic arrangements of the bacterial flagella. You do not need to know this for a quiz, but you did need to know it for the question in the uh, in one of the labs. So there's monotrichus where there's one flagella on one end, amphitrichus where there's flagella on both ends, and then lophotrichus where there's multiple flagella on both ends, and then peritrichus where the flagella are all over the cell. So if cells can rotate or swim, they have flagella, and that makes the cell look like it's running or tumbling. Taxis is the movement of a cell toward or away from a stimuli. Now here, we're actually seeing these cells move away from the light source. See the flagella are beating that way, so the cell's moving that way. And that would be phototaxis, movement toward or away from light. There's also chemotaxis, and that's movement toward or away from a chemical substance. Any question about any of that? So there are two different types of taxis, chemotaxis and phototaxis. Now there is a special flagellum found in spirochetes, and that we call the endoflagella or an axial filament. This is only seen in spirochetes. Or is that also in spirals? But we'll just say spirochetes because that's what we have in the lecture. Uh, the, the flagella is anchored at one end of the cell and it's inside the cell wall. So if you see, let me blow this up. See the cell wall here, the light pink. The oxal filaments are those reddish pink. And you'll note that they are surrounded by the cell wall. The axial filaments actually wrap around the cell, sort of like this, and then are responsible for the cell's movement, allowing the spirochete to swim. Let's see if I can get that going. Having a hard time launching that. There it goes. With the Fred Meyer app, you can always save big on your favorites with personalized coupons and deals. So, All right. You'll note that it can change directions. And let's go back there. Just by changing the way it's... Just by changing the way it's rotating, it can change direction. And there you can see something unique, and that is uh, spirochetes are very flexible. It's bending right here, and it was moving up and down, depending on which way it uh, is, uh, what's it, rotating? But here, it's moving like that, and then it can switch. Instead of being north and south, it's now moving east and west. Any question about any of that? Uh, spirochetes and spirals have this uh, corkscrew type movement. It's thought that that corkscrew type movement can actually burrow through the mucous membrane. So even if someone has a mucous membrane, spirochetes can get in through it and uh, infect a patient. All right, any question about the endoflagella? The special flagella that is actually inside the cell wall. And it doesn't work like a whip, propelling the cell to move one way. It actually causes the cell to 
had the corkscrew type movement, which will then move the flagellum through liquid. Another part external to cells are the frimbriae. There are these hair-like structures, yellow, protruding from the cell. They are shorter and straighter and thinner than flagella. They're used for attachment to surfaces. They are not used for swimming. Uh, a pathogen may have frimbriae and then the uh, pathogen will attach using the frimbriae to attach to their host cell. The pili, also called the sex pili, is another structure external to the cell wall. It is longer than a frimbriae. And it's also hollow on the inside. What the sex pili does is it's made by this cell and it actually goes out and then skewers this cell and then acts like a winch to bring the two cells together. However, the two cells do not have to be come really close because the sex pili is hollow and it's used, the sex pili, is used to transfer DNA from this cell to that cell. Any question about that? All right, let's talk a little bit more about the prokaryotic cell wall. It's a complex semi-rigid structure responsible for the cell shape. So if we have a bacillus or we have a caucus, that cell has a shape because of its cell wall, giving the cell that shape. The few uh, bacteria that do not have a cell wall are pleomorphic, meaning they take on many different shapes. So the cell wall is responsible for the bacteria having its uh, shape. And that's also true of the archaea. The archaea have their unique shapes depending on the cell wall. The cell wall protects uh, the cell and prevents osmotic lysis. For example, if we were to put a red blood cell in a beaker of water, water would move into the red blood cell and the cell membrane would expand. And then more water would move into the cell until the water expands the cell membrane till the cell membrane bursts the cytoplasm would then leak out of the cell and that would kill the cell. If a bacteria cell falls in a bucket of water, water will move into the cell, expanding the cell membrane, but it'll only expand up to the cell wall. Once the cell membrane touches the cell wall, the cell membrane cannot expand any further and that will prevent more water from moving into the cell. So the cell wall prevents the cell membrane from expanding and then bursting, and that would kill the cell. So the cell wall prevents osmotic lysis by the cell. The cell wall is outside the cell membrane. It's actually the last part of the, the cell structure that we consider part of the cell. The cell wall can contribute to the pathogenicity of some species, like mycobacterium have a unique cell wall, and that cell wall contributes to the pathogenicity of mycobacterium. The cell wall of bacteria is mostly made up of peptidoglycan. It is the main molecule in the cell wall of bacteria. It's not the only molecule, but it's the main molecule. Peptidoglycan is a polymer of, re of a repeating disaccharide, NAG and NAM. Let me blow this up. So we have the two sugars, NAM and NAG, 
And then they just repeat nam and nag, nag, nam and nag. And then we have rows of them and then planes of them. Now that's the disaccharide part, nag and nam. Oh, I forgot to mention what nag and nam stand for. Nag stands for N-acetylglucosamine. Nam stands for N-acetylmeramic acid. And the names probably mean as much to you as nag and nam, so you can learn either name. The disaccharides, meaning the nag and nam chains, are linked together with polypeptides. So we have a polypeptide from this chain linked to this chain down below by that polypeptide, short polypeptide. And then we have a polypeptide linking this chain to that chain. And in reality, it's, it's hooking this polypeptide to that polypeptide. But the point is that does link those together. And that makes a lattice linking the cell wall together with the polypeptides. Penicillin actually inhibits the formation of the lattice. Like penicillin can get in right here before this polypeptide is made. And this has to happen when the cell wall is putting down more cell wall. And so it starts putting down the cell wall here meaning putting down the penicillin. And before it links the uh, nag and nam chain here with that nag and nam chain there, penicillin gets in here. And then that peptide can't go across. That would create a gap in the cell wall where the penicillin created the gap by preventing the peptidoglycan from forming right there. Now the cell membrane can protrude out of this gap right here. And then water can move into the cell, causing the cell membrane to protrude further out of the cell wall. And that will continue until the cell membrane bursts. And that would kill the cell. Any question about any of that? Let me remind you that in gram positives, there is more than one layer. There's more than even three layers of peptidoglycan. It's something like a uh, hundred layers of peptidoglycan, maybe more. And then in the uh, gram negatives, it's more than just one layer of peptidoglycan. It's something like 3 to 20 layers of peptidoglycan. The gram-positive cell wall differs from the gram-negative cell wall. Here we're seeing the gram-positive cell wall, which has a thick peptidoglycan layer, the yellow being the cell membrane. And that's all there is to the uh, gram-positive cell wall. I mean, there are other molecules besides peptidoglycan, but peptidoglycan is definitely the main molecule. And this just layer upon layer of peptidoglycan. There's only three layers shown here, but as I stated, it's a hundred or more, maybe even more than a thousand layers of peptidoglycan. We do have some other molecules in the peptidoglycan. There's tocoic acid, which helps link the peptidoglycan together. And then there's lipotocoic acid, which does the same as tocoic acid, help linking the peptidoglycan together. But lipo, lipotocoic acid actually uh, anchors into the cell membrane. Any question about the gram-positive cell wall? Well, let's just go to the next. Uh, the tocoic acid may help regulate the movement of cations through the cell wall. 
Now, cations do not need to choic acid to move through the cell wall because a cation will be soluble in water and water will go right through the peptidoglycan. So anything dissolved in the water will go right through the peptidoglycan of a gram-positive cell wall. But the tachoic acid uh, can help the cations to move down the peptidoglycan and then eventually move into the cell. Any question about any of that? Uh, the polysaccharides on the uh, cell wall can provide antigenic variation, and then we can distinguish different cell strains or even different species from the uh, polysaccharides providing antigenic variation. We haven't really talked about antigens, but an antigen is something the body recognizes as foreign and then responds to, meaning it can make an antibody to the antigen. We'll talk more about antigens much later in the course. The gram-negative cell wall differs from the gram-positive cell wall. Mainly, the peptidoglycan layer is thinner. We only see one layer of peptidoglycan shown, but in reality, it's never one layer. It's at least three layers of peptidoglycan. But it is much thinner than the gram-positive cells. And then the gram-negative cell has a lipo lipid layer outside the peptidoglycan, as well as a lipid layer inside the peptidoglycan. Now, the lipid layer inside the peptidoglycan is the cell membrane. And it's mainly a lipid bilayer where the main molecule is phospholipid. When we look at the lipid layer, which is a bilayer outside the peptidoglycan, we call this the outer membrane of the cell wall. So it is part of the cell wall. It is a lipopolysaccharide, meaning it has composed of a lipid, which is lipid A, and an O-polysaccharide, which is the hair-like structure coming out of uh, this membrane. The lipid portion is the important part because it is lipid A. If you do not know, lipid A is an endotoxin. Toxins are something that are toxic to us. So if any time a patient gets a gram-negative infection and the bacteria has a cell wall, that patient will be exposed to uh, lipid A, the endotoxin. Any question about any of that? And what's a patient to do? Well, generally, the clinicians want to treat the disease. So they'll prescribe antibiotics right away. But when that kills the cell, that will release the lipid A. And then the patient just has to deal with that endotoxin. Any question about any of that? All right, like I said, the outer membrane is a part of the cell wall. It's external to the peptidoglycan layer. And we actually call it the outer membrane of the cell wall. Its main molecule is, of course, phospholipid, which is the main molecule found in the cell membrane. There are other molecules found in the outer membrane, such as proteins and carbohydrates. Obviously, lipid A the endotoxin. And uh, I didn't mention proteins, especially the pro porin protein is a protein in the outer membrane of the cell wall. 
And then there can be carbohydrates in the cell wall as well. Showing you a blow up of the gram negative cell wall. You can have lipoproteins in the cell wall and they will anchor the outer membrane of the cell wall to the cell membrane. You can have proteins in the uh, cell wall. It, it, the internet is telling me, telling me we have an unstable connection. So if you don't hear something, please let me know and I will repeat it. Let's talk a little bit about the porin protein. Uh, the cell needs and wants certain things. And for those molecules to move through the cell membrane, the cell will make an active transport protein, which will then pump that molecule inside the cell. And that could be something like glucose or an amino acid. The cell knows it wants that molecule and it'll make a protein, which is an active transport protein, to move that molecule from outside the cell to inside the cell. The uh, outer membrane of the cell wall is similar to the cell membrane, and that is it does regulate a lot of material moving into or out of the cell. We do not have active transport proteins in the outer membrane, but we do have a porin protein. The porin protein is similar to an active transport protein. The main difference is the porin protein can take a whole lot of molecules and then allow them to go through the, the outer membrane of the cell wall. So the porin protein is not being specific for one molecule like the active transport proteins are. The active transport proteins mainly, mainly will only move one molecule from outside the cell to inside the cell or vice versa. They can also move one molecule inside the cell to a molecule outside the cell. The point is the active transport protein is specific, and we'll talk about it being that way. In fact, it's not, as you know, some uh, drugs can affect the active transport protein. There used to be a heart medication that did that, a beta blocker. I can't remember the specifics of it now, but uh, the point is the active transport protein, generally speaking, allows only one molecule to move through the cell membrane. And how you move all the different sugars into the cell membrane and all the different amino acids is you make a transport protein specific for that molecule. And then it can move and only move that one protein from outside the cell to inside the cell. The porin protein moves a whole slew of different molecules. I don't know how many, but it's hundreds or thousands of different molecules can move through the porin protein. So we have the same porin protein that would allow glucose to move into the cell through the outer membrane of the cell wall, as well as the amino acid glycine the amino acid is sparing gene. Any question about any of that? I talked about lipopolysaccharides, lipoproteins, and phospholipids. I, I don't really quiz you on the periplasm, but you can call the gram-negative cell um, 
Let me blow it up here. Where the peptidoglycan is, meaning external to the cell membrane, but it internal to the outer membrane of the cell wall, we have the periplasm. And this is the region of the cell wall containing the peptidoglycan. I think I went too far. The uh, cell wall, especially the outer membrane of the cell wall, can give the cell some protection, like the gram-negative outer membrane of the cell wall protects the gram-negative bacteria from complement proteins and certain antibiotics. Like penicillin G cannot penetrate the outer membrane of the cell wall. So penicillin G would not be an effective bacteria to give if a patient has a gram-negative bacterial infection. Any question about any of that? All right, the gram-negative cell wall can also uh, protect the cell from certain antibiotics like uh, Penicillin G, so penicillin G would not work on gram-negative bacteria. That doesn't mean there aren't antibiotics that will, will work. There are other antibiotics that will work on a gram-negative cell. Polymyxin B is an antibiotic that only works on gram-negative cells. And for my apartment complex, um, they allow many things to be recycled, not all things, but they'll accept carbon, glass, and many plastic things to be recycled. And that's sort of the way the porin protein works, and that is it allows many things to enter, but prevents other things from entering. And the complement protein would be something that would not be allowed to enter the gram-negative cell. Uh, penicillin G would not be allowed to enter. That doesn't mean that we can't get the cell hit by an antibiotic. Like I said, there's penicillin G, which will hit gram-negatives. In fact, this one only hits a gram-negative cell. And then we have the third member of the penicillin family, ampicillin, which does hit gram-negative cells, as well as gram-positive cells. How ampicillin gets through the outer membrane of a gram-negative cell is, is that the molecule differs from penicillin G, and we'll talk about it later in the term. It has uh, side chains, which give the molecule the property to be moved through the porin protein. I already mentioned a little bit about antigens. The old polysaccharide of gram-negative cells is antigenic, and it is responsible for, for example, E. coli 0157H7. O157 is a specific old polysaccharide in the cell wall. And this E. coli, O157H7, is a human pathogen, meaning it's highly toxic to humans. E. coli, which is normal E. coli, lacks this antigen, and it is not pathogenic. It actually helps us digest our food. And, of course, it's found in the intestines or the gut. Uh, lipid A is the molecule that is responsible for the glycoprotein. Um, 
the person who is working on identifying the species which causes penicillium. No, that's the mold. Penicillin, no. What I'm trying to say. Um, for the infection. Ampicillin can get through the gram-negative outer wall to stop the infection. A penicillin G cannot get through the outer membrane of the cell wall. And so it will not be effective on uh, gram-negatives. Ampicillin is similar to penicillin G. It just has uh, short side chains on the molecule. And because of that, you can... Uh, take that orally and then it will climb to a good dose and last a fair amount of time before you have to take the pill again. The point is, is that molecules can use the porin protein and sometimes they can use that porin protein to harm the cell, such as what ampicillin does. But there are other molecules like penicillin G that cannot get through the outer membrane of the cell wall. And so the enterprise is safe from uh, this antigen or this antibiotic. We're talking about antibiotics. All right, let's take a little, little look at uh, the cell walls, gram-negative and gram-positive and how they differ. The gram-positive have a thick peptidoglycan layer, giving the cell a rigid structure. The gram-negative cell wall has a thinner peptidoglycan layer, so the cell is not as rigid, but it does have a cell wall, giving the cell a specific shape, so it's not non-rigid or flexible, but it's just not as rigid as the gram-positive cell. We find tocoic acid, that molecule in the gram-positive cell wall, there are no tocoic acids in the gram-negative cell walls. In the gram-positive cell wall, there is no outer membrane of the cell wall. In the gram-negative cell, there is an outer membrane, and this outer membrane does contain lipid A, and lipid A is an endotoxin. Any question about any of that? All right, so the gram stain stains the gram positive and the gram negative cells differentially. It's because of the difference in the peptidoglycan layer. because the gram-positive cells have a thicker peptidoglycan layer, the decolorizing step does not remove the primary dye from the cells, and they will remain purple and take on a purple color. The gram-negative cells, on the other hand, have a thinner peptidoglycan layer, and the crystal violet iodine complex will wash out of this thinner peptidoglycan layer. The alcohol of the uh, gram stain also will dissolve the outer membrane. And that means there's no membrane separating the bacterial plasm inside the eukaryotic cell or proto-eukaryotic cell. Um, alcohol also dissolves the outer membrane of the uh, gram-negative cell. And then we use safranin to stain the cells which were clear to give them more contrast with the background of the slide, and they will appear pink. All right, this slide is showing you a summary of the gram-positive cell. 
and then the gram negative cell, you only need to know the very top of this table. You don't need to know the lower portion. So that's the typical cell wall of a bacteria. But there are some bacteria that have unusual cell walls. And then there's one domain of prokaryotic cells that tends to have a cell wall, but the cell wall is not made of peptidoglycan. And these are the archaea, the first atypical cell wall. They don't even belong to the domain bacteria. So it's not surprising their cell wall differs from the bacteria. Instead of having peptidoglycan in their cell wall, they have pseudomerine, which is another disaccharide. And there are a few archaea that even lack a cell wall, so they don't have peptidoglycan either. The next two categories of atypical cells are bacteria. The first I want to talk about are the mycoplasmas. The mycoplasmas lack a cell wall. So these cells do not have a cell wall. They have no particular shape specific to the cell, and they'll just grow out in the environment however they want to. If something's blocking them, they'll just grow around it. If bacteria move, once again, they move because of the presence of flagella. The mycoplasmas, not only lacking a cell wall, they have sterols in their plasma membrane to give the plasma membrane a little more support and a little more strength. If you remember, animal cells also lack a cell wall, and we have sterols, specifically cholesterol, in between the fatty acids of our cell wall. And this helps hold the cell wall together, meaning you'll have an intact um, nail if you have your uh, cells free of uh, um, damage to the nails because there is an outer membrane. Anyways, mycoplasmas differ. They're an atypical cell wall. That is one family of bacteria. There's another family of bacteria that have atypical cell walls, and those are the mycobacterium. We've already talked about these guys. They have acid fast staining properties because they have a whole bunch of mycolic acid in their cell wall. Mycolic acid is a lipid, and that makes um, molecules that are not lipid soluble have trouble getting through the cell wall of the mycobacterium. And then the molecule which is trying to get through could then act on the cell. And that could be something like a, an antibiotic. If it can't get through the cell wall of uh, mycobacterium, the antibiotic isn't gonna be effective in treatment. Mycolic acid is the molecule. It gives the mycobacterium several properties, including that they uh, retain the acid fast stain. So we call them acid fast cells. They do prevent many molecules dissolved in water from moving across the, the cell wall. And let me see if I have a picture of the mycobacterium.
This is a little different picture than I'm used to, but that's all right. Let's see if I can blow this up. Can't read it though, it's a troll. There we go. So this is the cell wall to uh, this bacteria, which is mycobacterium. And it does have a peptidoglycan layer. It's the dark blue layer right here. But it has a layer of mycolic acid outside the peptidoglycan. Most molecules that a cell is exposed to are going to be lipid soluble. And that includes something like glucose and fructose, amino acids, proteins. These molecules will have trouble getting through the cell membrane of the mycolic acid because mycolic acid is a lipid and only lipid soluble molecules can get through the mycolic acid. Now the um, gram negative cells have a membrane, which is largely lipid, but then they have the porin protein that they get through. The mycobacterium do not have the porin protein. So the only way something can get into the cell would be if the cell wants it, and then we'll pump it into the cell some, by something like active transport, or if the molecule can dissolve through this mycolic acid. Now that helps the uh, bacterium, the mycobacterium, from being killed by a water-soluble antibiotic like penicillin G, as well as uh, other, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Antimicrobial agents, like a, bacteria a bactericidal agent, something that kills bacteria. If that molecule is dissolvable in water, it probably will not get through the mycolic acid and then would not affect the mycobacterium. On the other hand, a uh, deserming agent, which is very weak, like alcohol, it kills very few cells, but not all cells. Uh, alcohol can get right through the mycolic acid, and most bacteria, um, alcohol does kill the bacteria, but it doesn't kill all of them. So we say it is a weak antiseptic agent or antimicrobial agent, but yet alcohol is very good at killing mycobacterium. And the reason being is the alcohol can easily get through the cell wall. And then once it gets inside the cell, it can denature essential proteins. Any question about any of that? I'll leave that in case I want to go back. All right. You can damage the prokaryotic cell wall either by uh, the antibiotic penicillin, and it could be any member of the family, uh, stopping the peptide bridges from forming in the peptidoglycan. Another way you can damage the cell wall is by treating the cell to the enzyme lysozyme. This enzyme digests the peptidoglycan, destroying the cell wall. Lysozyme is an enzyme made by our skin and the mucous membranes, the upper mucous membranes of the mouth and upper throat and nasal cavities. And that enzyme is secreted to uh, destroy potential pathogens. You don't need to know the terms uh, for uh, a cell treated with uh, uh, lysozyme, just that you can. So as I stated, the gram-negative bacteria are not as sensitive to the gram-positive bacteria to some antibiotics, such as penicillin G, because it cannot get through the 
sporin proteins in the outer membrane. And so it does not get inside the cell and then interfere with the um, cell putting down peptidoglycan. That doesn't mean it's not, gram-negative cells are not sensitive. There are other antibiotics that do work on gram-negative cells. Streptomycin is a lipid-soluble antibiotic, and it's very good in treating the mycobacterium. And then we could use a... a, a what is it going to call the an agent that drops down uh, antimicrobial peptides? All right. Any questions about any of that? If not, let's move on to the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is largely a phospholipid bilayer. It does have proteins in it, actually three different types of proteins, peripheral proteins, integral protein, transmembrane proteins. It also has carbohydrates and uh, lipids in it, which are not shown. But it does show you here the phospholipid bilayer. Let me blow that up. Phospholipid bilayer. And phospholipid is the main molecule in the membrane of a cell, or for a prokaryote, the main membrane uh, is the cell membrane. The only membrane is the cell membrane in a prokaryotic cell. You can have proteins in the membrane, and they can be peripheral proteins. Those are proteins which are mostly on one side of the membrane or the other. So this protein is mainly outside the, um, the cell membrane. And so it's a peripheral protein. This is another peripheral protein and it's mainly inside the, uh, the cell membrane. We can also have active transport proteins or channel proteins that allow certain molecules to enter or leave the cell. These proteins are usually specific, meaning in general, they will only allow one molecule to move across the membrane. For example, we have an active transport protein to move fructose into the cell. We also have an active transport protein to move glucose into the cell. Uh, the uh, Active transport proteins are generally transmembrane proteins where they span the membrane. The plasma membrane, as well as I guess all membranes in our cells, is actually a fluid. It is a membrane of uh, phospholipids and proteins making a mosaic and it is as fluid as olive oil. If you don't know, olive oil is a little thick liquid at room temperature. And if you put it in the refrigerator, you will solidify the olive oil or at least most of it. And it's always amazing to me to think that my hand is held together by nothing but membranes between my cells. And that means my hand is held together by fluid cell membranes. The uh, cell membrane is fluid enough that proteins can move about. If you don't know, uh, in A and B you will be taught, that the proteins usually, once they bind to a ligand, it will, the proteins will usually move together before they bring the signal inside the cell. The proteins can then therefore move about, many of them, as well as they can rotate, stay in place, and then rotate around. The phospholipids can do the same thing. They can rotate around 
or they can move from one place to another. The difference with the the uh, the phospholipids is uh, you can only move if there's no phospholipid next to you that you can move into. That actually is uh, how water can move across the cell membrane. It's not how water moves across the cell membrane or roots because uh, this process takes too long that I'm going to talk about. And with roots, they move the water uh, through the cell with aquaporins. You don't need to know the name of that. And that's to move water quickly inside the cell. Assuming this, the, uh, the cell or the plant or the whatever organism needs water, we will have the uh, water move across the roots very quickly and then uh, uh, use the water. All right, any question about any of that? The cell membrane has shows selective permeability. That means that some molecules can move across it and others cannot. No large molecules can move across the cell membrane or any membrane in a eukaryotic cell without the use of a transport protein, like an active transport protein. So proteins, for example, cannot move across the cell membrane and then be utilized by the cell. That's true for almost any large molecule. Ions either do not move across the lipid bilayer of a membrane or they move very, very slowly if they move at all. Lipid soluble molecules obviously dissolve in lipid and they can move right through the uh, outer membrane of a uh, cell in the uh, bacteria, or they can move right across the, the uh, plasma membrane of a eukaryotic cell. The reason being is, is that the membranes are mostly lipids, and then lipid-soluble molecules can dissolve in the lipid bilayer and then move into the cell. Smaller molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse across the cell membrane. And that's mainly because they're small and they're nonpolar. Like oxygen and is perfectly nonpolar. And uh, carbon dioxide is mostly nonpolar. So we're just going to say it's a nonpolar molecule. Water is a polar molecule, and it can move into the cell, but not very quickly. Let me maybe draw that. I'm not seeing paint. There it is. So we have a lipid bilayer. Oh, wrong thing. And this lipid bilayer is mostly made up of phospholipids. I'll try and draw them here. I'm gonna have a hard time because I'm having trouble doing that. And then there'll be another phospholipid right here. And then the head of the phospholipid right there. Try and connect that. for the phospholipid bilayer. What happens for water is, is that a phospholipid right here can move over here. That means the water can move in right here but it can't get further than right here 
because there's a phospholipid right here. Try and draw that in there. So the water stays right here. But what the water does is it stays right there and it just waits for this molecule to move over. And then uh, there's nothing right here. Maybe I should have cut that out instead of erase it. And now the water, which is here, can now move up to here. Meaning it is initially stopped by one side of the lipid bilayer, but the water just waits right here until that phospholipid moves. Then the water can move up and then it can move right into the cell. And that is how water moves across a membrane. Any question about any of that? All right, if there's no questions, I'm gonna stop here and I'll see you at six. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the regular term. This is the summer. I think I continue lecturing. Yeah, we go to 6.50. I was thinking we went to 6.20. So let me continue. Let me close that. Oh, it looks like I shut down the wrong thing. Don't need that. Yep, I shut down the PowerPoint. All right, any question about the plasma membrane and selective permeability? If not, let's talk about miscellaneous things involving the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane of bacteria contain the enzymes for ATP. We'll talk about this later in the term, but the enzymes in bacteria that make ATP tend to be in the plasma membrane. Any question about any of that? That's also true for the photosynthetic pigments found in the photosynthetic bacteria. We call them chromatophores or thylakoids. It's in the foldings of the cell membrane where these pigments are. We don't have chlorophyll in uh, bacteria but that is a photosynthetic pigment. And if there was chlorophyll, it would be in the uh, membrane or foldings of the membrane. Let me, uh, well, let me just blow this up. Blow it up further. So the cell membrane normally is a layer right below the cell wall. And we might be able to see it right there. But uh, in reality, in this cell, the cell membrane will be here. And then it swings around in a fold right here, then comes out and then swings around in a fold again. Comes out. Uh, that looks like there's another fold right there. those foldings in the cell membrane where we have both the pigments and the enzymes for making ATP. 
if you damage the plasma membrane, the uh, cytoplasm will leak out of the cell and that will kill the cell. You can damage the plasma membrane with alcohols, quaternary ammonium compounds, and with the polymyxin antibiotics, like polymyxin B puts a hole in the cell membrane of a bacteria. And that's how the antibiotic works. Let's talk about movement of materials across membranes. Movement of materials across the plasma membrane is a critical feature of cells. There are two ways or processes that material can move across the plasma membrane. There are passive processes and there are active processes. A passive process is where the material moves down a concentration gradient, meaning the material at high concentration outside the cell moves into the cell because that concentration of the material is lower. The movement is occurring down a concentration gradient. And this is passive movement of material. Active movement against a material is against the concentration gradient. For example, your cells have digested most of the glucose from your meal that's in your intestines. So the cells have a lot of glucose in them because they've digested most of the glucose or pulled it out of the lumen of the intestine. We'll word it that way. But there is still some glucose. The active transport protein comes into play and it will pump glucose from outside the cell to inside the cell, even though that's happening against a concentration gradient. And because you're doing this against the concentration gradient, it then takes more energy for the reaction to occur than it would for a reaction that is not moving against the concentration gradient. So active transport of material happens when the concentration gradient is lower outside the cell and then the molecule is moved inside the cell. This takes energy and a transport protein. The energy is obtained by ATP and it gives the transport protein the energy it needs to move the molecule across the cell membrane. Let's talk a little bit more about passive processes. There are three different processes where the molecule moves down the concentration gradient. There's simple diffusion, and that's where a solute diffuses in to a liquid like water and then can move into the cell. There's facilitated diffusion, which is similar. It's just that the molecule is moving because of the help of a protein. And that's not really an active transport protein because the molecule is moving down its concentration. So it needs no energy for that reaction to occur. And so ATP is not used up to give the cell energy to move a molecule down a concentration gradient using a facilitated diffusion meaning a protein that specifically moves the molecule into the cell. And oftentimes that protein is a channel protein, allowing that molecule to just move right through the protein and move into the cell. The third passive process is osmosis. Osmosis is a little different because instead of the solute moving, it is the solvent that is moving. And osmosis is using the solvent water moving down a concentration gradient against a semi-permeable membrane, such as when water moves into a cell. The water mo molecules move from areas 
of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. And that is osmosis because it's water that's moving, not the solute dissolved in the water. What did I want to talk about there? Water moving across the membrane. Osmosis can occur in the uh, root where there are aquaporins, or it can happen in the plant, like you put a drop of water on a leaf of corn, the water will uh, slowly move into the cells. There aren't necessarily aquaporins to move the water in quickly, but it will move into the cell slowly by moving across the, uh, the phospholipid barrier. Water is very important. The movement of water is very important in living systems. So you should know that. Let's talk a little bit more about simple diffusion, the movement of a solid from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. For example, if you put a drop of dye in this beaker of water, the highest concentration of the dye will be right here, and the molecules in the dye will move away to areas where the molecule is at lower concentration. Any question about that? And there we're seeing it, the dye molecules moving throughout the water and eventually given enough time, the dye will evenly disperse throughout the whole beaker of water by simple diffusion. You'll note simple diffusion does not have a membrane like a cell membrane, although it can. Like when CO2 moves out of the cell, it will diffuse right through the cell membrane. And then oxygen will diffuse into the cell right through the cell membrane. All right, our next uh, uh, passive process is facilitated diffusion where we have a protein that moves the molecule across the membrane. The molecule itself cannot move through the lipid uh, bilayer of the cell membrane, but it can move through a protein, like a channel protein, or this one is calling it a transporter protein. It's not really a transport protein because it's not using ATP to move this molecule into the cell. The example here is glucose, but I don't want to use glucose. I want to use uh, fructose because fructose works this way. It uses facilitated diffusion so that when you eat a diet high in fruit, you have a bunch of fructose in your gut. The fructose molecules will move into the gut cell by facilitated diffusion. The molecules will move down their concentration gradient, meaning it's high outside the cell, low inside the cell, so the fructose molecules will move into the cell. That will happen with fructose until the concentration of fructose inside the cell is equal to the concentration of fructose outside the cell. Once the two concentration equal, fructose will stop moving into the cell. And what you need to say is the net movement of fructose will stop moving into the cell because in reality, if one fructose molecule can move into the cell, as long as another fructose molecule moves out of the cell, meaning there's no net mood movement of fructose into the cell. And that's the way fructose is digested. No matter 
how much fruit or how little fruit you eat, you will only dissolve the fructose to the point where the fructose concentration outside the cell is equal to the fructose concentration inside the cell. So you will never digest all the fructose. And that's good for people you know, on a diet or something like that. Uh, if you eat fructose, not all of it will be dissolved. On the other hand, if you eat glucose, you have a diet high in sugar, so you have a lot of glucose outside the cell and little glucose inside the cell. Initially, glucose will move into the cell by facilitated diffusion. A protein will move the glucose into the cell, costing the cell no energy. With glucose, though, once the concentration inside the cell equals the concentration of glucose outside the cell, this protein will now change. And instead of acting as a facilitated diffusion protein, it'll switch and become an active transport protein. And then it will move glucose against its concentration gradient until there's no glucose outside the cell. So if you're eating glucose, all of that glucose will be brought into the cell and then eventually digested. And that's bad if you're trying to lose weight and you're on a diet. You don't want to eat glucose because all of it will be uh, taken in by the body. If you eat fructose, on the other hand, most of it will be taken in by the body, but never all of it, because once the concentration outside the cell equals the concentration inside the cell, no further fructose will move into the cell. Fructose is totally, moves into the cell totally by facilitated diffusion. Glucose does not. Glucose is a, a separate category, and I don't want to discuss it further. Any question about any of that? All right. In both simple and facilitated diffusion, it is a solute that is moving into the cell, and that solute is moving down a concentration gradient from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. We have one other passive process, osmosis, and it's the net movement of water, which is not a solute. Water is a solvent. And water moves selectively across a permeable membrane. So to have osmosis, you have to have water moving from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And that water has to move across a membrane, such as the cell membrane. Any question about any of that? Now, when we're talking about water moving into the cell, you should understand that it is water that is moving, but we do not define tonicity by the water. We define the tonicity by the concentration of the solutes dissolved in the water. Where the water concentration is high, the solute concentration will be low. And where the water concentration is low, the solute concentration will be high. Any question about that? So when we're talking about tonicity and the movement of water, you should know that there are three different tonicities, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. Each of these is a relative term. So it's correct to say that the solution outside the cell was hypertonic relative to the solution inside the cell. 
Any question about any of that? All right, let's talk about isotonic, the easiest one to talk about. In an isotonic solution, the concentration of the solutes outside the cell is equal to the concentration of solutes inside the cell. There will be no net movement of water then into or outside the cell because the solution is isotonic. Now notice how I said net movement of water. For every one water molecule that moves in, you have one water molecule that moves out, meaning there's no net movement of water. The cells are actually happy in an isotonic solution because they do not die from too much water moving into the cell and then popping the cell membrane, nor do they die from pinocytosis, and that would be water moving out of the cell. Like our red blood cells are isotonic when they're in the blood. Otherwise, they'd lice. But if we put red blood cells in water, it would not be an isotonic solution, and water would move into the cell until the cell burst, and that would kill the cell. There's also hypotonic solutions, and this is where the solute concentration is lower outside the cell than the solute concentration inside the cell. That means the water will move from areas of high concentration or outside the cell to areas where the water are lower in concentration to inside the cell. This will cause the cell to swell. Uh, if the cell has a cell wall, the cell membrane will expand up until the cell membrane touches the cell wall. At that point, the cell membrane cannot uh, expand any further, and that will prevent the cell from bursting the cell membrane and then dying. And when the cell membrane cannot expand any further, that will limit the flow of water. No more water will move into the cell because there's no space for the water to go. All the water spaces are full. If the cell lacks a cell wall and you put the cell in a hypotonic solution, then water will move into the cell until the cell membrane bursts. And that we call osmotic lysis. Most bacteria actually live in a hypotonic solution. And that's, you don't need to know this, but that's why penicillin G works the bacteria that's inside our blood, for example, it's in a hypotonic solution. There's more solute molecules inside the bacteria than in the blood. And so when we give penicillin G, that will cause defects in the cell wall. And then the cell membrane will protrude out of the cell wall. Water will move into the cell and will continue moving into the cell until the cell membrane bursts. Any question about any of that? Like I said, the last point you don't need to know for this lecture. I'm just giving you some trivia. Hypertonic solutions are where the solute concentration outside the cell is higher than the solute concentration inside the cell. This will result in the net movement of water out of the cell. That will shrink the cell membrane away from the cell wall. And that too can resolve in plasmolysis. As the cell membrane uh, shrinks, the water will move out of the cell that generally will lead to cell death. It depends on what cell this is, 
but many cells like E. coli are not very tolerant of losing water. And sometime, a fairly short time, something like in the neighborhood of hours, uh, with the water moving out of E. coli, the cell will die. Other cells can live, like Staphylococcus aureus, can live for an extended period of time. They may not be metabolically active or they may not uh, be engaged in cellular re reproduction, but they are alive and they can survive for days or weeks on end. The mycobacterium are particularly good at survival and they can survive uh, in a hypertonic solution for months, maybe even years, depending on the, the endospore. All right, any question about tonicity? Oh, let me give an example. When uh, bacteria falls into a bottle of molasses, the water will leave the bacteria because it's a hypertonic solution. And that usually will result in plasmolysis Will the bacteria like E. coli will die because it lost too much water. All right. Uh, we've already talked about active transport where the molecule moves against its concentration gradient. A passive process, processes works well when the concentration of the substance required by the cell is higher outside the cell than it is inside the cell. And then the molecule can move into the cell by a passive process. But what do you do when the cell environment is low in a nutrient concentration? For example, the open ocean or in the sand dunes of the Sahara Desert, the molecule that the cell is going to want, like glucose or amino acid, is going to be very low outside the cell and much higher inside the cell. So clearly a passive process cannot work. What we use is active transport, where the molecule can be accumulated against a concentration gradient. What happens is the cell uses energy to perform the work of moving the molecule against its concentration gradient. And the molecule that does this is an active transport protein, which pumps the solute against its concentration gradient. When we're talking about an active transport protein, you should realize that that does require the use of a protein, but for that protein to work, you have to use up one ATP, meaning split one ATP, to give the protein the energy it needs to transport the molecule against its concentration gradient. And with many molecules like glucose and amino acids, you will want every molecule moved into the cell. With other molecules like uh, fructose, you want some to move in, but it isn't essential that everything moves in. And in the older houses, uh, like for example, the, the protein would not move into the cell by uh, a passive process because it's has to move across its concentration gradient. So it can only move into the cell by an active process. And that splits ATP so the cell can have the energy to move that molecule into the cell against its concentration gradient. Any question about any of that? All right, there is another active transport that is seen only in prokaryotes. It is not seen in eukaryotes. Excuse me, I was getting a frog in my throat. 
This is called group translocation, a special form of active transport, which does require a transport protein. It does require energy, although it doesn't come usually from ATP. The energy comes from a high energy phosphate compound, which could be ATP, but usually it's not. And then the molecule which is moved into the cell is chemically changed as it is transported into the cell by group translocation. For example, glucose, which moves into the cell by group translocation, does require a transport protein to move it into the cell. It does require a high energy phosphate compound like PEP. And then the glucose, when it move, is moved into the cell, is chemically altered. So glucose is changed into glucose 6-phosphate. The alter, alteration prevents the escape of the molecule from the cell and allows the cell to accumulate substances at higher concentration than would otherwise be allowed. So how do I want to do this best? Let's talk about a cell in uh, group translocation. There it is. Let's pull that up. So we have our cell here. And we have a molecule out here that the cell wants. And it's going to move into the cell by group translocation. I'm not sure how to quickly do that. Why does the cell use group translocation? As opposed to active transport. Let's say we have 10 glucose molecules. Not sure if I'm still in the, uh, I don't think I am. So we have 10 glucose molecules. If five of them move into the cell, by group translocation, I'm just gonna go G, T for group translocation, and then five move into the cell by active transport, let's just go AT for active transport, this will be easier for the cell than if we had 10 glucose molecules outside the cell. And all 10 of them moved into the cell. by active transport. The reason being is, is that with the uh, 10th molecule, meaning nine glucose have moved into the cell, we now have the one outside the cell. Let's do that over here. So there's one glucose outside. And there's nine glucose inside. It is really difficult moving one glucose inside the cell against nine because of the gradient difference. 
it's much easier, instead of moving one against nine, it's much easier moving one against five, just because the gradient is not as high. So this last one moving into the cell, instead of moving one against nine being in the cell, we now only have, well, let's say four, because uh, that'll be the fifth one. Uh, we have uh, one moving into the cell and there's four inside the cell. So the gradient is one against four instead of one against nine. And it's thought that group, group translocation helps a prokaryotic cell bring things into the cell and accumulate them at higher levels than you could if you only had active transport alone. Because the gradient is not as high if you move some things in by group translocation and other molecules in by active transport. Whereas if you move them all in by one, like active transport, the last one you move in, that last glucose, would be really difficult moving in into the cell because there's already nine glucose molecules into the cell. It's much easier moving it into the cell if there's only four glucose molecules in the cell and then the other were moved in, others were moved in by uh, group translocation. Do you see that, people? If you have trouble understanding that, email me and I'll try and go through it again for you. Uh, so group translocation is a way that prokaryotes can move things into their cell. And it's similar to, but different from active transport. All right, I think we'll stop here and I will uh, see you at seven for the lab. Any questions? All right, see you in the lab.